let's try this. Okay, gonna make the review sheet pretty big here and then trying to go back and forth with the PowerPoint. All right, let's take a look at what we got. So you got causes of the War of 1812. Let me tell you the causes of the War of 1812. There's two of them. So there's Indians that are attacking American settlements in the Northwest. And the thought is that um, they're getting the guns from the British. So the British are arming Indians. Also the impressment. The British are impressing sailors. So if we go over here to the PowerPoint and we scoot up just a little bit, uh, we're going with causes. So there's cause number one right there. Um, natives are attacking uh, American settlements, and we're thinking the British gave them the guns. It's making especially guys we're going to hear about quite a bit, a little bit later. There's the handsome version of John C. Calhoun and then uh, Henry Clay. They're the Warhawks. They're going to get angry about that. All right, cause number two is the impressment, uh, and they're kidnapping sailors and pressing them into service of uh, the British Navy to fight against the French. most famous case of that was the Chesapeake in 1807. All right, so there's your causes um, of the war. War heroes is next on the sheet. So William Henry Harrison defeats Tecumseh, and then later on he's going to win the Battle of uh, Tippecanoe. So there's war hero number one. Uh, war hero number two, if we come on down, is going to be Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans. Um, so there's your war heroes. And if you go up to the review sheet, you got causes, then you got those two guys. All right, so then if you look at these two, you got Washington, D.C. and the Star, Star Spangled Banner. So coming over here. Let's work our way up uh, or down to uh, Washington, D.C. All right, so the British send all their army to Washington, D.C., and they burn it down. Uh, Madison's the president, and he barely gets out of there alive, and his wife, Dolly Madison, got out of the White House just barely with a portrait of uh, George Washington. Uh, Fort McHenry is in Baltimore, which is very close to Washington, D.C., so the British attack it next. Francis Scott Key is the guy who... Uh, witnesses this attack. Remember, he's going out to uh, get POWs on this British POW ship, and they tell him we're going to have to spend the night on the ship because we're fixing to attack Fort McHenry. So he watches this thing, uh, and he writes the poem about it, and, you know, the next morning the flag's still there. The only way he knew the flag was there at night was when the rockets red glare and the bombs burst in air. That sort of thing. All right. Um, so then you got the treaty that ends the war, and nobody wins. It's a stalemate. So that's the treaty again. Um, so that's the War of 1812. <coughs> Nevertheless, even though we didn't win, we felt good about it. So if we go back here, uh, there's three reasons that we're going to feel good about it. Um, this is the era of good feelings right here. So... Heir of good feelings, Monroe becomes the president. Uh, several things going on. Number one, because of the Hartford Convention where the Federalists considered secession. I mean, they were, had some legitimate griefs because of the Three-Fifths Compromise. Virginia planters keep getting elected president. They're losing business during the War of 1812. But the more radical Federalists considered secession, and everybody's proud of having stood up to the British um, in a second war not losing. So nobody wants to be a Federalist anymore. So there's no more Federalists. So there's on, only one political party. We're proud of fighting against the British and not losing. It'd be like getting in a fist fight with John Cena or The Rock or somebody like that. Uh, and so it creates this sense of nationalism. The economy's strong, so feeling good about the economy. And finally, Monroe goes on this goodwill tour. He's a Republican, but he even heads up into Federalist New England, uh, and so that makes a good impression on the Federalists. And so for all those reasons, you've got this air of good feelings. <coughs> all right, let me go down to the next slide. Part of this good economy is the American system. So this nationalist economy being pushed by the folks who had been the Federalists, they're going to end up being the Whigs once Jackson gets in there. So there's three parts of the American system if you look at your new and review uh, improved review sheet, I've got American system in there. All right, so three parts of the American system. The Bank of the U.S., that second Bank of the U.S. that Jackson's going to get all mad about. 
the protective tariff, hey, when it gets raised to high levels, it's going to be called by South Carolina the tariff of abominations. And the transportation improvement, we're going to see all those roads and canals and railroads uh, in that, uh, you know, that market revolution chapter. But uh, Henry Clay's American system is kind of the driving engine for this market revolution. All right, let's look down. Um, deer in the air of good feelings, there's going to be some concern. So here you take a look at them. The two concerns is going to be slavery and Latin American independence. Okay, so let's go back. Um, is slavery going to spread to the new territory that we get from the Louisiana Purchase? You know, that question over the spread of slavery is going to cause controversy after Louisiana Purchase, and then we're fixing to get to after the Mexican-American War. All right, so the Missouri Compromise says Missouri will enter as a slave state. Maine will enter as a free state. The line, 3630, above the line, no slavery. Below the line, slavery. There's more anti-slavery territory, no slave free territory. However, you can't grow cotton out there in the Dakotas and Montana and Wyoming and so forth. So the pro-slavery folks could kind of live with it. Henry Clay is our great compromiser. He negotiates the Missouri Compromise. Let's keep going straight down. Um, so that's more parts of the Missouri Compromise right there, the 3630 line. Okay, so then you also got the Monroe Doctrine. If you will recall, uh, Mexico gets its independence, 1821. All the Latin American countries had gotten their independence by the early 1820s. And so now we're concerned that the FRAP countries, France, Russia, Austria, Prussia, are going to come in here try to take over new and vulnerable and weak Latin American countries. So Monroe says, don't you do it. Now, John Quincy Adams is kind of the guy who comes up with it. He's the Secretary of State. Uh, Secretary of State is a stepping stone to the presidency, but Monroe's the president, so we named the thing about him, named the thing after him. And it's kind of drawing this line in the sand, if you will, to borrow a phrase from William B uh, Barrett Travis, Travis at the Alamo, except it's not in the sand, it's in the ocean. And saying, Europe, don't come around here no more. That's a Tom Petty land, uh, uh, line. Tom Petty died during the teaching of this unit. Don't come around here no more and try to take over territory around here. Now, we couldn't enforce the thing. We had a little weak, rinky-dink Navy. But Britain was trading down here. So even though they don't like much, us much, they just got through fighting the War of 1812 against us. They'll still protect these countries with their navy because they're trading down there. All right. And let's go back to the review sheet. Uh, and so that takes care of um, everything in the Monroe and War of 1812 chapter. So now we're moving on to the Jackson chapter. Okay. Uh, so come down here. Boom, boom. Uh, the court cases didn't quite make it. That treaty didn't quite make the review sheet. All right, so here we go, the election of 1824. So that's what this is what's leading to that corrupt bargain, right? Um, all right. So uh, in 1824, you got all these folks running, but there's one political party, so they're splitting up the vote four ways, and so nobody gets a majority. You see that Jackson gets the most votes, but not a majority. So if nobody gets a majority, it goes to the House of Representatives, all right, as the slide says right there. Okay. Um, Clay didn't make it into the top three. He was number four uh, in the electoral count. Not in the popular vote, but the electoral count. Crawford, this fellow, the yellow here, he was six, so he couldn't become president. He was in no shape to become president. So in the House, it comes down to Adams or Jackson. Well, a lot of folks in the House felt like Jackson was kind of crazy, including uh, Secretary of State Henry Clay, uh, who's kind of the kingmaker in this decision. So he gets together with Adams, uh, and he supports Adams, and so Adams gets chosen to be president. Uh, Adams turns around and chooses uh, Clay to be Secretary of State, and to the Jackson, the Jacksonians, this feels like a dirty deal. So they call it a corrupt bargain. All right, uh, Adams, you know, he was a nice fella. His presidency doesn't go well. He doesn't have that common man touch. 
Um, so we're looking at John Quincy Adams' politics there. Uh, and so if he had been running a little bit later, it would have been a Whig. You know, he's in favor of transportation improvements, uh, national education. And, you know, he's a good guy. He's anti-slavery, pro-Cherokee. But he doesn't have the common touch like W and like Clinton do. Uh, also, everybody's all mad at him over the corrupt bargain. The Jacksonians are mad. The South is mad over this high tariff, the tariff of abominations. So the deck is kind of stacked against him. So he gets whooped for president in 1828. Jackson wins a landslide. And in 1828, the common man can vote. Uh, most states dropped the property requirement for voting, and so Jackson's winning in a landslide. Okay. Um, so you're looking at Jacksonian democracy here. That's rule of the common man, right? Uh, and so in certain ways, Jackson gets kind of simple. All right, let's go down. Spoil system. <coughs> He's giving jobs to his buddies. And somebody might say, hey, that's corrupt. You can't be doing that mess. However... He feels like the common man has a natural sense of right and wrong, just like Jefferson believed the common man had a natural sense of right and wrong. So what's the big deal? Let common men work in the government. So that's the spoil system. It didn't give away that many spoil systems jobs, but the spoil system is very much associated with him. Okay. Hey, the Whigs called him King Andrew. He's vetoing a lot of bills. The Whigs don't like that. They act uh, like, you know, there's Abraham Lincoln. We've seen that picture again. Clay's a Whig. Lincoln's a Whig. Um, and the first six presidents had vetoed laws they thought was unconstitutional. Jackson just vetoes any old bill that he doesn't like. Okay. Um, so then we're headed to the Trail of Tears. Let's check the review sheet. Um, and so spool system and wigs and vetoes goes right there. So I'm skip, skipping down to injured removal. Come back to bank wars and notification here in just a second. All right. Um, so there's the five civilized tree, tribes, trees. Remember, you make your mouth go up and down, Cherokee Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole. They're trying hard to assimilate, especially the Cherokee. Got an alphabet, you got a newspaper, uh, Chief Van House is a plantation owned Cherokee, uh, some of the Cherokee owned slaves, their capital was New Echota, right up the interstate. Um, but people wanted the land, for the gold, for the farming, so the Cherokee, they're going to be good citizens, so they sue, but martial rules, they can't sue because they're not citizens, so they get... The citizen, Wooster, the missionary to New Echota to sue on their behalf. Georgia wouldn't give him a license to be a missionary because he was a radical troublemaking missionary telling them that they didn't have to leave. Um, so, But he was a missionary anyway without a license, so they throw him in jail and he sues Georgia. So in Wooster versus Georgia, Supreme Court rules on behalf of the Cherokee says they don't have to go. All right, the famous Andrew Jackson line is Marshall's made his decision, let him enforce it. The Trail of Tears ensues. A fourth of the ones who go on the Trail of Tears die along the way. Plus, they to add insult to injury, they had to pay the soldiers that made them go. All right, so there's your Trail of Tears and Indian removal. All right, uh, so now we work our way to, hey, remember that? Uh, that was a cute little um, kind of pro-Jackson political cartoon. Remember, he's being the great father there. Point of view on that one. All right, here you got banking stuff. All right, so let's see what we got. Um, we didn't really include, so you got the nullification crisis. Really didn't include the sex scandals and the bigamy on the review sheet. Um, so what do we got instead? You got nullification crisis and bank wars back to back. Uh, so let's go with it here. <clears throat> nullification. Southerners don't like that big high tariff. There's old John C. Calhoun. Dang, he's mad about that sucker. Look at those eyes. He's having to pose a long time. Plus, he's gotten older since the War of 1812. All right, and hey, you know he's going to be the big defender of slavery when you know the slave debates are coming along. All right, so South Carolina is going to nullify the tariff saying it's too high. We ain't paying. The Congress says, you got it, the force bell. So then South Carolina says, if you try to make us, we're going to secede. Jackson says, if you try to secede, there's going to be civil war, and I'm going to hang this guy who had been my vice president. 
Henry Clay saves the day again with a compromise tariff, lowering the tariff in the South agrees to pay. All right, so there's the nullification crisis. Okay, bank wars, here we come. Jackson hates the Bank of the U.S. He sees it as a tool of privilege and power. Uh, he personalizes everything. He doesn't like Biddle, who's the president of the bank. He hates Clay, who tries to recharter the bank down his throat in 1832. So kind of pictures the bank as a monster. Uh, Clay can't get the recharter passed. Uh, well, he passes it, but then Jackson vetoes the recharter of the bank. And then he's not satisfied with that, so he pulls all the money out. Um, da, da, da. Do we have more banking stuff? There it is. All right. Um, those two political cartoons, you know, the bank is a monster here. All right. So he replaces the bank and he pulls all the money out, uh, the Bank of the United States, replaces the bank with, puts the money into the state banks, also known as wildcat banks, also known as pet banks because they're run by uh, Jackson supporters. They're making the easy loans, printing paper money. Uh, folks can't buy, pay back the loans, inflation because of the paper money. Uh, so then he prints, pay, uh, quits printing paper money altogether. So you got this bad economy that's his fault. The Panic of 1837, poor old Martin Van, Van Buren gets blamed for it. Uh, and we know that Harrison's going to beat him in 1840. Now we do. All right, let's check and see what we got over here on the review sheet. So it is full system, the Whigs, the vetoes, bank wars, nullification crisis, Indian removal. All right, and that ends the Jackson chapter. All right, so let's move on then to market revolution. So you can stop, you can answer, uh, pause it, ask yourself questions if you want to. Uh, Okay, so it's the market revolution chapter. So we little said a little something about cities growing. Uh, but this stuff kind of comes down to money and markets and uh, immigrants. All right, so let's see what we got. All right, market revolution. Starting out with Samuel Slater. So let's move our way down before we go to uh, the Irish. Uh, boom, boom, boom. So there's Samuel Slater. All right, and there's the reason U.S. industrialization is slow. There's a lot of land. Everybody wants to be a farmer. They don't want to work with, uh, in factories. Uh, and Britain already had uh, an industry. You know, they'd already had the original Industrial Revolution, so it's hard to compete uh, with Britain. All right, Britain had a law saying you couldn't leave Britain with blueprints over how to do a factory. So Samuel Slater here memorizes the blueprints, uh, same time, roughly the same time, Whitney's inventing the cotton gin that's going to make uh, slavery a whole lot more profitable. We're now familiar with that, uh, quote, King Cotton, you're not going to mess with cotton even if you think slavery is bad. Northerners. Okay, um, let's keep going here. All right. <clears throat> um, the New, Eng New England's where the industrialization is going to take place in the United States because they got the thin rocky soil. There's a lot of people, so they are going to want the factory jobs. It's right there on the coast, and Henry Clay and his American system uh, and his buddies, the Whigs, are going to be in favor of this tariff to help us compete with Britain. All right, so I believe that takes care of the first part of the review sheet on the market revolution. All right, I'm sure there's going to be a slide with the Lowell system, but let's go ahead and mention them. Remember, these are these young ladies that are working in Lowell, Massachusetts, so named for the guy uh, who sets up the first factory in the United States uh, in Massachusetts. And they kind of take care of the young ladies. They work long hours, but they get some education. They go to church. You know, they kind of look out for them. And then, you know, and once these young ladies become young adults, they leave and, you know, they start uh, taking care of their families, cult of domesticity. All right, so now let's go to our immigrant groups that we're pretty familiar with. Uh, and what? There's the little political cartoons that go with it. Uh, so there's the Irish. Uh, we know pretty well they're coming far from the potato famine. That's the push factor. All right, they're taking jobs in Boston and New York, East Coast cities. They don't want to be farmers. Um, people didn't really like them. The Know Nothing Party's going to form. 
Uh, and they're taking jobs. They're lowering wages. Uh, America, in the time of the Second Great Awakening, is very much of a tent revival, Protestant kind of country, so they don't like the Catholicism. Irish, the Irish get in trouble, they drink and they get in fights, and so the first police cars were called paddy wagons, uh, and some re uh, businesses would post Nina on the door, no Irish need apply. Okay, there's the Germans. The Germans going to do a little better, they're not as desperate, they're not as poor, Better educated so they can move out west, look for good places to farm, set up their own communities, kind of stick to themselves. But we have these contributions to American society, the wagon, the rifle, the Christmas tree, and kindergarten, which, let's change this once and for all, should translate to children's garden, right? Kindergarten. Okay, uh, and so that takes care of our immigrant groups. Let's go down. I mean, you can pause and ask yourself the questions if you want to. Uh, let's see if we get some uh, ladies. There's the ladies, I believe. The whole system. All right, so they're working long hours, low wages, but they're kind of taking care of them. So they do fairly well until the factories feel like they got to become more brutal and compete with British factories. So then you replace the ladies with the Irish immigrants. Ladies work for a while, then they go back home to take care of the kids in the age of Jackson. It's important that Junior get a good moral education because one day he might be involved in politics and he might have to vote. All right, so there's the little system. Uh, there's our inventions. Match them up if you would like. McCormick goes with the Reaper, Morse with the Telegraph, Howe and Singer with the Soul Machine, Deer with the Steel Plow. <clears throat> that Reaper's kind of the Western version of the cotton gin. All right, let's see what the review sheet has to say to us. All right, now we're getting to the transportation improvements. There's the telegraph and Morse. Um, so let's see if we can find an Erie Canal slide here. 15 miles on the Erie Canal. All right, uh, there it is. All right, 1825, so you've got all kinds of transportation improvements. If you move... Uh, you got highways and steamboats. A steamboat will go up and down the river, the National Road. All right, there's our buddy, the Erie Canal. Um, it's uh, it's going to connect the Hudson River to the Great Lakes, Hudson River going through New York City. So it's kind of the thing that's going to create New York City. Um, and kind of gets replaced, kind of romantic. You got the mules pulling the thing, and you got you know this life that you know the Irish immigrants get if they're working on the Erie Canal, hence the song. Uh, Sal's a good old worker and a good old pal, and they form a community on the route there on the Erie Canal. Okay, but the railroads kind of replace them. They're cheaper to make. Uh, they're not like mules where they'll refuse to go sometime. Uh, a railroad doesn't freeze the way the water in the ditch freezes. Uh, and so by 1860, you're getting lots and lots of railroads running east to west in... Um, the north, not nearly so many railroads in the south. All right, let's go back to the, re let's take a look at the slide. Other things, so you got the regional integration and other transportation improvements. Let's take a look and see what we got right here. All right, so it looks like if we work our way down, we got the clipper ships and the Pony Express and then the inventions, the Reaper, and then that's going to take care of the market revolution chapter. All right, so uh, so there's the Pony Express. Uh, it's out west. It only it ran from Missouri all the way to California. It only lasted 18 months. It's pretty dangerous to ride a horse all the way across the mountains and the deserts. Uh, the countries linked up regionally. You know, the South's growing the cotton. New England's got uh, uh, the textile industry. And in the west, the farmers growing the grains and raising the livestock. Uh, nope, nope, nope. Looks like we've made it to the um, the culture chapter, the reform movement. Uh, John Wesley, uh, the little Irish blessing there. All right, and there we go. All right, so you've got the second Great Awakening. Uh, like the first Great Awakening, is a bunch of revivals, 10 revivals, you know, out there in the frontier, people get all fired up. Hell, Fair, and Damnation sermons. 
But this second one is going to be about bringing heaven down to earth. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, so all these reform movements are coming out of that. You know, the women's movement, the temperance movement, the abolitionist movement, the utopian societies, all mo generally speaking motivated religiously one way or another. All right, uh, what do we got? The leaders of the Great Awakening, Finney and Cartwright. Uh, Cartwright would get in fist fights at his, uh, at his revival meetings, tend to be women's leaders that are leading the church there. Uh, the Baptists and Methodists are growing quite a bit in the South as a result of that, and they're also splitting with the Northern denominations over slavery. Mormons are the big ones. Hey, let's see if Mormons, Mormons are a big deal. Let's go down here and see if Mormons are on the review sheet. Yeah, there they are. Okay, uh, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. Joseph Smith founded the Mormon church in New York. He's living in the western part of New York where Buffalo is. The burned over districts is because he had so many uh, revival meetings out there. Um, people don't like him. He's an abolitionist and a polygamist both of which were kind of unpopular. So he moves out to Illinois where it remains unpopular. He criticized the government. He gets himself killed. So Brigham Young becomes the leader of the Mormons and he leads the Mormons out to Utah. Uh, Utah, the mountains and the deserts where they'll be left alone. He doesn't go all the way to California. Um, they flourished out there. They were successful farmers in spite of the dry cl climate of Utah. Uh, they continued to practice polygamy until the late 1800s, in which, uh, at which time Utah is not allowed to become a state until polygamy comes to an end. So it's not the Mormon church anymore. Mitt Romney is a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, and he is monogamous as opposed to polygamous. Uh, so the Mormons no longer practice uh, polygamy. All right, let's go back to the sheet. And so you're moving on to kind of women stuff here. All right. Hey, you can review if you want to. Here we go. So the women, they're rebelling against the cult of domesticity. Remember, Bloomer, she's fun. These corsets were un uncomfortable, so she develops the more comfortable woman's dress. All right. Uh, the leaders of the women's movement, Stanton and Mott are the main two. Uh, Susan B. Anthony's coming a little bit later. So Stanton and Mott are leading the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. At the same time, the Mexican-American War is going to end. It's in Seneca Falls, which is in that burned-over district, named after uh, one of those Iroquois tribes from the colonial times, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, which is modeled on the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we learned that it said all men and women are created equal, and it also says he has, he has, he has, except for this time he is men in general as opposed to uh, King George. All right. Uh, they were also the temperance folks because guys were coming home and beating up the family, uh, and as a result of the temperance efforts, less people drink. I mean, people... Prior to the women's movement, you know, people today drank half as much as people back then did. So they were somewhat successful. All right, let's go over here, take a look at the review sheet, see what we got next. All right, so now we're going to the transcendentalists. Mm, okay. All right, and so now let's go ahead and say something. Um, I was looking at some question that didn't quite make the cut on the test. But it said what the transcendentalists are doing and all these writers are doing is they're trying to create a national culture. So let's keep that in mind. Not because it's going to be on the test tomorrow, but we want to be on the lookout for that. So we really hadn't had a chapter where you're looking that hard at American culture because, I don't know, American colonial British culture kind of barred from the British. American culture, colonial culture was British culture. But now we've got our own culture. So the first leaders of this culture are going to be the transcendentalists. All right, hey, they're going to rise above popular opinion. They're going to be against slavery. They're going to be 
uh, you know, against the traility or skeptical of the opinion of the common man. To transcend means to rise above. They believe we're all connected by the oversoul. We probably wouldn't say the word oversoul. We'd say the word the human spirit. That part of us that's going to keep on keeping on and keep on pushing. Tell us understood that these bad lads start treating us good. To quote a Springsteen line. All right. Uh, Emerson writes self-reliance. Um, where he says, you know, rely on your own conscience, your own inner light, uh, as opposed to po common opinion. Uh, Thoreau writes Walden after uh, hanging out in the woods for a while to get away from common opinion. Um, Got to go over here. Uh, and maybe more importantly, he's writing on the duty of civil disobedience. He protested the Mexican War that we've now learned about. Uh, he wouldn't pay his taxes because he felt like the Mexican War was going to get us all that land in the Southwest and was going to expand slavery. Uh, and in civil disobedience, he argues that you don't just have the right, but the duty to disobey the law um, if you think the law is unjust. All right, Little Women was also written by the daughter of a transcendentalist, Bronson Alcott. Um, okay. Let's go to the review sheet. All right, so then on the review sheet, you'll see <coughs> uh, that we've just got some authors there. So what, we've got, you know, Irving did The Legend of Sleepy to Hollow. Hawthorne did Scarlet Letter. Cooper did The Last of the Mohicans. Um, so this is national culture here. We have American authors now. Uh, Poe and Melville. Um, oftentimes, there's a common man theme here. Jacksonian America is better than City on a Hill, uh, Colonial America. Uh, we're losing something when we're kicking the Indians out. But in some cases, you know, it's really not about the common man. But we're forming a national culture, pride of who we are as Americans culturally in addition to everything else. All right, and so that ends the authors who made the cut. All right, Alcott, she wrote uh, uh, Little Women. All right, uh, and Moby Dick about uh, the right well there, Hawthorne, uh, is writing Scarlet Letter. All right, and so then you got these utopian movements. Uh, Melville's writing on Moby Dick. Um, no Nothing, we talked about that. Um, Horace Mann and Dorothea Dix. Horace Mann's the father of uh, public education, Dorothea Dix. Concern for the treatment of the mentally ill, and she got them out of, you know, cages uh, where they were being kept, and we have insane asylums as a result of her efforts. Arca, okay, here come the utopians. So what they're doing is they're withdrawing from Jacksonian America because they don't think that America's ever going to quite get it right, but maybe we can get it right in a community. So New Harmony, Indiana was the first one. didn't work because relations were not harmonious, strangely enough. Okay, Brook Farm is the farm run by transcendentalists. But John Green on his video about this culture here says, hey, the moral of the story is that writers, authors, make lousy farmers. And the farm burned down and the crops didn't grow and it was a big failure. All right, the Shakers were the folks who said all sex is bad, so sex and marriage is bad too. So they didn't have any kids, but they kept making converts, and they danced in church. Uh, so that was a pretty successful one. And then finally you got Oneida. It was kind of the first hippies. They practiced free love there in the Oneida home, but they can't make any money. So they recruit this guy who manufactures animal traps and silverware, and then they just give up on the free love thing. And so today Oneida is a silverware, co silverware company. So if you want to, you can pause and you can match those things up. I will come over here uh, and take note that we have finished the left side of the review sheet. Uh, and so now all you got right, uh, left is the slavery chapter over here on the right. All right, so we work our way down. Uh, and so here we go. All right, let's take a look at the review sheet, see what we got. All right, social structure. Whites in the South, 
so the first four of them have to do with kind of the white south here. All right, so you remember how it goes. Um, you got that saying, King Cotton. Nobody's going to mess with cotton. Cotton's king. Northerners need the cotton for their shirts and so forth. Britain's buying uh, southern cotton. So if a war comes, the south southerners are going to feel like, hey, the British going to be on the southern side. Okay, southern oligarchy. Remember now, hey, what? Let me make a triangle here. So remember the social structure? The 1% is the planners. Uh, the 24% are the small slave owners, and then the 75% of southern whites don't have any slaves, but they're hoping to have them one day. So vast majority of 99.9% of southern whites were pro-slavery. Remember, we've talked about the Grimke sisters. They were uh, anti-slavery, but uh, southern abolitionists was hard to find. All right, these planters believed in honor. Uh, don't be telling them that they're not honorable people and calling slavery evil is kind of dishonorable, so that kind of outlook is going to help lead to the Civil War soon and pretty soon. Okay, uh, for everybody else, raising cotton wasn't really a winner. Um, they're dependent on this one crop the same way the Irish we're dependent on the potato crop. Uh, they would move. I've got to, got to, got to change that. So they're moving to Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas because in Georgia and South Carolina, the land goes back. So they're moving south and west. Uh, a lot of these planters kind of live high on the hog, so they stayed in debt. Um, so white southerners didn't do terribly well, but they still wanted slaves. Okay. Um, so you can make that pyramid if you want to. All right, we go over here to the review sheet, and what? We said the black belt is where the cotton grew best based on the nature of the soil. All right, and then we're looking at slave life, really. All right, so come back over here, go on to the life of the slaves. There's four million. Most slave owned slaves were born in the United States. There's the black belt there. Uh, tend to be the southwestern part of the Old South uh, as the land here in Georgia and South Carolina gets ruined. All right. Um, here we go. All right. You're better off being a house servant than you do are a field hand. However, you're very vulnerable. If you don't raise the kids in the big house right, you might be turned out uh, to be a field hand or you might be sold down the river or your family might be sold down the river to New Orleans and sugar plantations where people die pretty quick. Um, a consensus among really everybody was that the worst part of slavery uh, was the splitting up of families. Maybe the second worst part of slavery was the whipping for disobedient slaves. Okay, uh, you've got uh, the effect of Christianity. So for the planner, Christiana, Christianity makes obedient, well-behaved slaves. For the slave, it's code language for how to escape, and it tells them the story of Exodus and slaves escaping, escaping from Egypt. Um, you know, in that movie, Birth of a Nation, Nat Turner is given kind of angry, smite your enemies, Old Testament kind of sermon. So there's another uh, way slaves might look at uh, Scripture. But it's providing comfort really to both sides. And so it's kind of an open question whether slave, whether Christianity was a help or a hindrance to slavery. All right, when slaves don't want to cooperate, they usually don't leave slave rebellions. They might escape, but they probably don't make it. So more commonly what they're going to do is work slow, break the tools, pretend they're sick because if they're not sick and the master makes them work and they die, that's a lost $2,000 investment. You know, may either kill the masters in the but more likely make them sick in the house. But there's different forms of more passive resistance. Okay, there's the questions. You can answer those questions if you want to. Let's look up here, see what we got. All right, so now we're going to Nat Turner. It looks like I have misspelled abolitionist. Abolitionist. That's better. All right, so we're going slave rebellions next. Looks like, 
So you got the free African Americans, you know, just because they're in the South uh, and they're free doesn't mean their life's very good. They could be caught and sold into slavery pretty quick. Um, we looked at the dilemma that uh, slaves who performed well had, so they'd have to become slave drivers or over slave, overseers if they took the jobs. Okay, here comes the slave rebellions. There's four of them, not very many. So Stone Old Rebellion, 1733. Uh, Gabriel Prosser, 1800. Sono Rebellion was in South Carolina. Colonial times. They're going to make it to Florida, which was Spain at the time. Denmark Vesey was a free African American. If you're trying to remember it and you can't, think Denmark up there in Northern Europe is a place where they would never have slavery. So everybody there is free. So, I mean, those two you can kind of get crossed up. So I'd use Denmark uh, in the association we have with Denmark as being a very northern kind of place. All right, by far the most important one is the Nat Turner Rebellion. He was a slave preacher in Virginia, and he kills a lot of people. Uh, I don't know, 60, 70 whites. Uh, and they catch him and they hang him, but they, uh, they interview him about it, and he says he's not sorry. He felt like God had chosen him to be Moses to his people. All right, so the slave codes come after that. The White South really freaks out and really cracks down on any liberties that uh, slaves would have. No education, so when Frederick Douglass gets taught to read his master's breaking the law, no guns, no more slave preachers like Nat Turner, no meeting at night well, where they might hatch a plan, can't be off the plantation without a pass. All right, so there's the slave rebellions and the slave codes. All right, there's the review. You can take a look, at pause it on the review. I'm going to, coming over the review sheet to see what we got next. Abolitionists. All right, so we come back. <clears throat> And here we go. All right. Um, the Quakers were the very first. The colonial Quakers are kind of our very first abolitionists. Coming out of the Second Great Awakening in the age of Jackson, uh, abolitionists were mostly always religiously uh, motivated. I checked. I did a little research. Uh, the president of Liberia was named Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor. All right, um, but the early abolitionists were racist. They were also slave owners from Virginia in many cases. And so they set up this American Colonization Society because there's no way slaves will ever be able to live with whites if they get set free, they believed. Um, and so they set up the country of Liberia um, for freed American slaves. James Monroe was a member, uh, and so Monrovia is the capital. Very few slaves actually went to Liberia because the 99% of American slaves were born in the United States, not in Africa. Okay, uh, the radicals. So you got William Lloyd Garrison who had the Liberator. Uh, he's got that quote. I will, let's see how much of it I can remember. I am in earnest. Dang it. I will not retreat a single inch. I will not equivocate. Now, I've got all that stuff out of order. And I will be heard in all caps. Uh, and he wanted the North to secede from the South because you got this thing, the Fugitive Slave Act, that says if a slave runs away and makes it to the North, Northerners are supposed to help slave patrols return the slaves to the South. But if the North secedes and forms its own country, the North becomes like Canada and doesn't have to send slaves back. All right, so he's a radical. So Journal Truth was a lady and an abolitionist, uh, escaped from Maryland into the North and fought for abolition and also was a women's rights advocate like uh, Stanton and Mott, and Mott and Susan B. Anthony. Okay, let's continue. Frederick Douglass is our main man. He was also from Maryland, taught to read by his owner. A uh, famous speech where he says, I sold this head, these arms, these legs, this body. Because he stole his, you know, his body was his master's property. Uh, he wrote his autobiography about his time in slavery. Uh, throughout the Civil War, he is pushing Lincoln to become an abolitionist rather than somebody who just wants to keep the country together. You have a number of abolitionist parties. Uh, the Free, you know, the Liberty Party is abolitionist. Free Soil and Republican Party kind of moderate abolitionists. They just don't want slavery spreading. Uh, to the Louisiana Territory or to the Southwest that we get from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Northerners didn't like abolitionists. You know, they liked cotton. And so these folks were taking a stand as uh, what Emerson says we ought to do. Uh, don't follow the crowd. Okay, 
There were a few Southern abolitionists, uh, the Grimke sisters, but they weren't very popular. Generally speaking, Southerners led by John C. Calhoun started saying slavery is a good thing. The Bible defends it. The ancient Greeks relied on slavery. Aristotle was pro-slavery. Uh, just listen to them out in the fields. They're singing. That means they're happy. Uh, and they're better off than a northern factory worker who'll be on his own uh, when um, he uh, can't work in the factory anymore or Africans you know, than they have been over there in Africa. Okay, here's the last one. You weren't allowed to speak out against slavery in the South. Um, you weren't allowed to read speeches against slavery in the House of Representatives thanks to the gag resolution. For eight years, you couldn't do that. John C. John Quincy Adams, I uh, almost said John C. Calhoun, John Quincy Adams had his moment in the sun, not as president, but as a member of the House of Representatives fighting against that gag resolution. And the mailman got in trouble if he delivered abolitionist mail. All right. There you go. There's John Quincy Adams. Uh, and there's the end of the review sheet. All right. So let's go over here and see if we can do this thing. All right. What do I do? I think I hit. No, here's what I do. I go over here.